All right, open your Bibles to Genesis, and we are in chapter 27, chapter 27. We are going to be covering a lot of interesting topics today, actually. We're going to be covering a lot of interesting topics today, believe it or not. Genesis chapter 27, let's finally wrap up this chapter. Uh, we're going to go to verse 43, 43. Recall that Jacob deceived his older brother Esau. And this does look very weird, so I have to get used to this. We, I'm just staring at a piece of pole that's like right in front of my face. Okay. Recall that Jacob ran away. Uh, Jacob deceived his older brother Esau. And because of that, Esau has become very bitter and angry, and he wants to kill Jacob. What happens is Rebecca eventually hears it. And remember, I'm going to go word for word through verse by verse. That's the purpose of this Sunday school hour when we do verse by verse commentaries. It's so that you can understand each and every word from the verse you're reading. And that's the goal of the Genesis verse by verse Bible study. So you can understand everything, okay? So if some parts sound repetitive, bear with me. That means it's a good sign if it's repetitive to you because that means your brain already uh, explained or interpreted the verse and I'm about to explain if something is repetitive to you. So look at the verse while I'm explaining and you'll get it, okay? All right, here we go. Verse 43. Now there, uh, let's see right here. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Rebecca is saying, that because of verse 42, Esau is comforting himself. He's trying to assure himself that he's going to kill Jacob, which will so-called give him peace. That's why Rebecca is saying, now that's why what you're going to do, my son, is you have to obey what I'm about to tell you. Okay, obey in what? And arise and flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. She wants Jacob to arise, get up, and to run away to her brother Laban in Haran. You recall that Rebecca, when she left her homeland, she left her family behind, and one of them is her brother Laban. And Laban is, as we studied before, he's a little bit of a sleaze himself. He's a little bit of a sneaky guy. When we go to verse 43 here, when he's, uh, when Jacob is about to run away to his uncle Laban in Haran. Rebecca says that you're supposed to obey me. You're supposed to obey me. Now go to Ephesians chapter six, Ephesians chapter six. There's gonna come a point in your life where you're going to have to disobey your parents. Now that's going to be kind of surprising for some of you who will hear that because commonly as we've learned, uh, from Sunday school and from church is that we are supposed to obey our parents if you're a child. Why? Because parents know what they're doing. You're supposed to honor them. However, in this case, I mentioned that you are supposed to disobey. And you might go, well, uh, Pastor, that's a little bit extreme, right? No, you got to read what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6. It's not the way you think it to be. So go to Ephesians chapter 6, and obedience is as follows. In verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. Notice right here, you are supposed to obey your parents, which is why... Uh, Jacob might be sinning if he doesn't obey his mom, you might think. However, the verse says, obey your parents in the Lord. That's very important. So obedience to parents can only come when their request is accordingly to the Lord. If it's not accordingly, if it contradicts the Lord, then what are you supposed to do in that case? You are supposed to disobey. You are not supposed to follow. So if we go to Acts chapter 5, go to Acts chapter 5. Jacob, think about it. 
because he obeyed his mother's voice, he really messed up his life and wasted a lot of years, believe it or not. We can see from the passage in Genesis, it would be better that Jacob disobeyed his mother, right? Let's be honest. When Rebecca said, obey my voice, I want you to run away to my brother. When you're hearing that in your mind, you're like thinking, that's not a good move. That's a bad move, right? That's outside of the will of God. That's following what you want to do. So when we think about it that way, we can see that her request or her command is not accordingly to the will of God. It's outside. That's why in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it points out that Peter said what? We ought to obey God rather than men. So when we come to that point of obeying God or obeying humans, who are you supposed to pick? You're supposed to pick the Lord and you're supposed to reject humans. When you reject human in preference to the Lord, then that means you're obeying God instead. So when Rebecca says something that's contrary to God, are you going to obey God's will or are you going to obey Rebecca's will? See, so go back to Genesis 27. So that's the bottom line. It's not a matter of dishonoring parents. The idea is dishonoring God. So you don't want to dishonor God. And that's what Jacob did. He listened to his mother, which might sound like a good idea to you, but her command was dishonoring the Lord outside the will of God. That's why in Jacob's case, he dishonored the Lord then. So it's not a matter of dishonoring parents. The idea is it's about dishonoring God. That's what you got to focus on. If we go back to Genesis chapter 27, verse 44, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away. So the verse is talking about right here that Rebecca wants Jacob to stay, to live temporarily with Laban a few days. Now, if you know the story about Jacob and Laban, you know it's not a few days, it's been many years. So in Rebecca's mind, it's only just living a few days. Until thy brother's fury turn away. That's when, until your brother's anger expires. So it's only going to be a few days long. So stay temporarily. Now, this is another issue that you've got to learn yourself. And another wrong statement from Rebecca is notice how positive it sounded, right? She said it's only going to be a few days long. Well, obviously, we know that reality is that he stayed there for many years. And then she assumes that the brother's anger is going to turn away after a few days. So notice this positive statement that's outside the will of God. If you heard clearly what I just said word for word, the problem with this world is that when they are outside of God's will, and then they give positive statements. If you tell them, no, that's actually wrong, then the world's going to accuse you. Oh, come on. You don't have to say it that way. You don't have to be so mean about it. You don't have to be so uh, down about it. Why do you have to be all doom and gloom? Why can't you say something nice? Well, the thing is this, is that it doesn't matter how nice it, it sounds if reality contradicts. When reality is doom and gloom, and it's also outside of God's will, then it doesn't matter uh, how nice your statement is. It's wrong. It's wrong. Now, there are several passages to explain this. Go to the book of Judges 16. Judges 16. So when you're hearing a lot of preachers nowadays who smile and talk about positive statements, people are going to assume that that's a wonderful thing, that a preacher shouldn't yell, a preacher shouldn't be mean, a preacher shouldn't be negative. But you have to understand this. is That kind of mentality is a brainwashed mentality from the world. It's uh, what they call uh, the power of positive thinking. It's also called the positive gospel message, or they call prosperity gospel. You have to watch out for, the, uh, for those false doctrines that is preached from the church. If all your pastor is talking about positive statements, then he's a wrong pastor. He's not right with God. You got to realize that positive statements are okay if they're lining up with the Bible, 
and as long as you give the entire counsel of God, okay? But if you only say positive things, you never say something negative, you're not giving the whole counsel of God one. Number two, when you keep talking positive stuff, you're going to keep stretching things towards something positive, and you're going to stretch the Bible to something positive to the point that even if it's unbiblical, as long as it's positive, you're going to say it. And that's wrong. Look at Judges chapter 16. If you say, no, that's a wonderful thing. Well, look at Samson's case. If we go to, uh, if we go to Judges chapter 16, thank you. Notice what happened to Samson when you look at verse 20, 20. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. Notice that in Samson's case, he thought positively. And he said, I will go out as other times. I'm going to win. But positive thinking killed him, basically. Right. Yep. It put out his eyes. Now, if you listen to that positive garbage every Sunday, then what's going to happen is this. It might just kill you one day if you're not careful. Why? Well, let me give you a, the greatest evidence that pretty much uh, the, world, uh, the world, even the left wing, is going to agree with me. Okay. How positive did it sound when uh, Fauci declared the statement that, hey, the pandemic is spreading out. You need to know this bad news because it's for safety's sake, okay? Everybody in the world is like, oh, what a great doctor. Thank you so much for giving us that statement. But when you're telling them about hellfire where they're gonna burn forever, yeah. not a, <laughs> don't worry, all right, chill, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah. But when you tell them about burning in hellfire for eternity, then they freak out and they get mad at you. They don't thank you for that. Now that's strange that people would be scared about more of their health than the eternity of their soul. Right. It speaks volumes right here. So um, if, if the world heard uh, from Fauci that everything's all right, then the news media would probably crucify him, right? No, it's really, really bad <laughs> because you're going to kill all of us. That's what the world's saying, right? Well, then uh, look at right there. They admitted, they admitted that there is a case that something negative must be stated. Why? Because if you have a false fantasy of something positive, that that negative thing, that negative danger is not there, you're going to kill us. Yep. Told you so. See, left winger is going to have to agree with my statement right there. Go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Uh, I guess it was too deep. You know? I guess it was too deep. Yeah. Go to Matthew 27. But this should speak volumes to you about the power of positive thinking, how it can kill you if you're not careful. Positive thinking can kill you. That's the reason why you have to have a negative mindset at times. When you have a negative mindset, you'd be surprised how many times it can save your life. It can save your life. So we see Judges 16 is one case with Samson. Uh, Genesis 27 with Rebecca. And then Matthew 27, Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Okay. Notice that he was thinking positive. I am serve you, Jesus Christ. I, I am not going to deny you. Now, isn't that a wonderful statement? That sounds very Christian too. But it doesn't matter how Christian it sounds. That kind of positive thinking, when it contradicts scripture, then he, then you are wrong. You are wrong. So don't be fooled when you hear something Christian and it sounds so positive. You got to look at the scripture. What does the scripture say? That's the more important thing. Okay, go to Matthew. I said 27. Uh, sorry, I lied. 26, 26. All right. I was just testing you all out. All right, so Matthew 26. And then notice what Peter said at verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. 
Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. How about that? What a statement. What a statement. But Jesus was quoting scripture at verse 31. He said, no, the scripture says you will deny me. But Peter insists, no, I don't care what the scripture says. I prefer this positive thing. And it's very Christian thing to do. So I'm going to do it. So how dare you give some kind of statement like that? That's so negative. I don't care. Scripture. Isn't that the world? That's what's wrong. That's what's wrong. So beware of this positive uh, fantasy that this world is giving you that is not based on scripture. Okay, go to Genesis 27. Genesis 27. Now it did kill Rebecca, believe it or not, her statement. Because when she said it'll only be a few days, you know what? In this passage, this is the last case where uh, you see Rebecca is Genesis 27 or the beginning parts of 28. But once Jacob left that family, never saw her again. She died. She had a positive mindset. I'm going to see Jacob again. Things will calm down. And it didn't. It didn't. See, positive thinking can kill you if you're not careful. You got to watch out for that positive thinking. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 27 again. And I'll always let you know if I'm out of bounds. Okay. So Genesis chapter 27, and then, uh, you know what? I cannot move this at all. I have to stay here. Okay, yikes. Okay. All right, Genesis chapter 27, we'll look at verse 45, 45. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Okay, so remember 44, you're going to stay with Laban until uh, the anger of your brother directs away from you it's turned away from you it turns away to something else it calms down and esau forgets what you did to him yeah jacob tricked him then i will send and fetch thee from thence once esau comes down rebecca's going to send somebody or send a message to him and get him back that's the idea. Fetch thee from thence. So remember, fetch is such an archaic word that should be updated that people nowadays in New York City, you'll see them tell their dogs, fetch. No, no, you should update that language. You should use a modern Bible version word. Don't say fetch. Come on, man. See, you can, you can, uh, you'd be surprised how many so-called archaic words are still used nowadays and are very modern in today's society. So she's going to get Jacob to return from where he's at to where she's at. That's the idea. And fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? She's saying, why should I also lose you both in one day? Now, what does that mean? Lose you both in one day. Could it mean that Esau tries to kill Jacob and then Jacob tries to kill Esau? Maybe uh, that's how she can lose both sons in one day, maybe, but that doesn't seem to really make sense. Another reason why she might say that is because of Genesis 9. Go to Genesis 9. Remember, capital punishment is still reinstated. So due to capital punishment, it might be possible. So I say might, okay? It might be possible that because Esau murders his younger brother Jacob, then he's going to have to pay the death penalty himself. So that might be the reason why Rebecca says, I'm going to lose you both in one day. That might be possible. So don't forget Genesis chapter 9, what God told Noah. He said that capital punishment is to be reinstated Go to Genesis chapter 9, and then we'll look at verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man, whoso sheddeth man's blood. 
See, if Esau sheds Jacob's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So uh, Esau is going to have to shed his blood in return. So the statement of losing both, what does that mean? Jacob and Esau can both die. The theory is capital punishment. But Dr. Ruckman disagrees with this statement, actually. Go to Genesis. The context itself could give the answer. Me? I believe in giving you all the information. That way you can make your own conclusion. If I believe something to be a factual statement, then I'm going to tell it. But if I don't know, then I'm just going to give you possibilities, okay? Why? Because I'm an honest pastor, okay? I'm not going to pretend like I know something when I don't know. So I believe in being honest with you. All right, let's go to the book of Genesis 27. Genesis chapter 27. And then notice right here that the statement that Dr. Upman can propose is why Jacob and Esau can both be lost is Esau is already considered dead to her due to the very next verse. All right, look at the very next verse. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. So Rebecca saying to Isaac, her husband, I'm very tired of my life. Why? Because of the, his, uh, her daughter's in-law, which is Esau's wives. These, remember, were the daughters of Heth. They were from the family of Heth. Esau, remember, did... Uh, interracial marriage. If you recall during the Old Testament time of Abraham and the Jews, God gave a specific instruction that you are supposed to be your own nation, your own people. No other nations are supposed to come in and intermingle with you because of their paganism, their cultural, uh, their cultural sins. So God says you have to only intermarry, uh, you have to only have marriage within yourselves. So because of that case, Esau married one of the pagan daughters of the land. So Rebecca saying, I'm very tired of my life. See, it sounds like as if that her life is at a wit's end. Keep reading. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, she's saying, if my son Jacob, like Esau, takes a wife from the daughters of Heth as well, like Esau did, and even the women that are within this land that they live in, because all the women in that land are pagan from pagan cultures. Remember, Isaac and his family, they're sojourning in the land. They're not a nation that owns a whole territory yet. So they're sojourning with the pagans. What good shall my life do me? Do you see that? She says, if, uh, what good is my life? I might as well be dead. Why? Because if Jacob ends up like Esau, marrying the daughters of Heth, her life might as well be expired, she says. So in other words, Jacob is the only son that keeps her alive, that she sees as living. But Esau, she considers as dead. So that's the reason why she says, why should I lose you both in one day? Because she's seeing it as already that Esau is considered dead to her. So that seems like a very reasonable statement. So that's what Dr. Ruckman argues. Dr. Ruckman argues why. Both would die is not because of capital punishment, but because of interracial marriage that Esau does. Okay. So these are the two explanations here. We are now going to turn to Genesis chapter 28. Okay, I'm going to do this. I don't care. <laughs> there we go. And a little bit here, huh? All right. Oh, to joy. Okay. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. And then we'll look at verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, 
Okay, so that whole statement should be self-explanatory. Because of Rebecca's complaint, uh, Isaac summons Jacob. All right, so Jacob cannot marry the daughters of Heth. So this is what I'm going to propose. Isaac summons Jacob, and then he blesses Jacob. Then he gives him a charge by saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. You're not going to marry one of the daughters of this land that we live in in Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father. So you get up and you're going to go to Padanaram. Where is Padanaram? That's uh, Bethuel's place where he lives. Bethuel is Jacob's mother's father. So the idea is that's uh, his grandfather on his mother's side. And take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Jacob says, you're going to uh, get you a wife from over there where Laban is. You're going to marry one of his daughters, which is his mother's brother. So he's going to marry with one of his cousins. Now, if you recall, I'm not going to explain it right here. This has, uh, Genesis has been the most controversial book concerning about uh, incestual relationships. Like, uh, for example, when Adam and Eve had their children, how did they produce children in return unless they intermarried with each other, right? So that's been a big thing. The answer, as I had given to you before, and this has repeated with Noah and his family, and then we see that right here uh, with Jacob's case. Abraham also, as I've told you before, married his half-sister. So the answer to this was already given several times in my teaching. So I'm not going to repeat it right here. If you're curious, then you can always go back to my Genesis studies, or you can ask me after Genesis Bible study, okay? All right, anyways, verse 3, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee. Once he uh, marries uh, uh, one of the daughters of Laban at verse two, then Jacob says, let God Almighty bless you and then increase your fruits. So let him have plentiful amounts of children and multiply these. So that's self-explanatory. He's going to increase his seed. That thou mayest be a multitude of people. So that you, you yourself can become a huge amount of people, a great nation. That's the idea. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee. Notice how, Jay, uh, not Jacob, notice how Isaac realized that the blessing of Abraham does not go to his son Esau. He made it very specific. He says, may God give you the Abrahamic blessing, not Esau. It's going to be to you and to your seed with you. He made it very clear it's not going to be given to Esau. Isaac recognized that finally. Uh, one of the uh, problems with second generation Christian nowadays, as I've told you before, you can see another sign right here, is that usually they won't get the wake up call until they reap what they've sown, right? right? Until they see the consequence of sin right in front of their face and God slaps them in the face and God sure did with Isaac. You know, Isaac prized his son Esau. But God had to slap him in the face so hard where his prized son Esau is now about to become a murderer. And that's what finally opened Isaac's eyes. And he had to repent and realize, okay, the Abrahamic blessing goes to Jacob. Okay, so uh, Isaac states that. And then the last part of verse four, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. So Isaac says, when you get that Abrahamic blessing, then what's going to happen is you will inherit the land where right now you're a stranger at. So where his family is residing, the land of Canaan, as I told you before, belonged to the pagans. But even though they're strangers right now, Isaac and his family, they're sojourning, they're not uh, owners of the land. God says that they will inherit that land because God gave it to Abraham and God made a promise. Verse five, and Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Okay, so that's a long line. How do you do statement for just one simple thing? Basically, Jacob ran away to 
uh, Laban's side of the family. But the Bible is very specific with names. And then it'll tell you all the genealogies very well, which is why I like how detailed the Bible is. Because it is not shy and about historians. And archaeologists and historians love these descriptions from the Bible. The more detail it gives, the more it'll help them to find the clues in the archaeology. The Bible's not shy about that. The Bible will be bold about that. It says much compared to the Book of Mormon and the Quran. They don't do that much. But the Bible right here will give you, when it's giving you one thing, uh, one person or statement, it'll give you as much detail and specifics. And it's not shy about it. Why? Because it knows to be true. That's not a fairy tale. All right. Anyway, when you look at verse five, uh, this way. Okay. When you uh, look at verse five, it basically says Isaac sends away Jacob. So Jacob finally leaves his family and Jacob goes to Paddan Aram to where Laban, his uncle's at. And remember, Laban is uh, Bethuel's son. Now, Bethuel, notice right here, he's Syrian. So Rebekah, remember, is originally from Syrian descent. When the nation of Israel started, you got uh, obviously you can't just start pop, here's Israel. No. So they come from different nations. From these different nations, once they ended up in a family, and God considers that as that pure nation where they have to uh, maintain it as much as possible, where they are not influenced by pagan origins. So in this case right here, this is Abraham's homeland, and God wants to keep it that way. Abraham's homeland, because he sees that as the pure uh, descendants. And then eventually in time, as the people grow into a huge number, the Israelites, they can marry within themselves as a nation. That's how it works. But anyway, so they're from Syrian descent, which is why it's very interesting uh, where the Antichrist will come out in the future. The Bible says Syrian Jew. So Syria, uh, the nation of Syria and Israel are two big nations you got to pay a lot of attention to because they do have some intermingling later on throughout the scriptures, believe it or not, or alliances. So there's a very close relationship with Syria and Israel that God sees. Okay. Anyway, uh, Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah. So obviously referring to Laban. Laban is uh, the address. So the descriptions are son of Bethuel the Syrian. That describes Laban. Brother of Rebekah. That describes Laban. But then Jacob and Esau's mother describes Rebekah. All right, verse six. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take him a wife from thence. So Esau sees his father Isaac blessing Jacob and how his father sent, uh, how his father sent Jacob away to Paddan Aram. Why? To marry, to find a wife from that direction. Once he finds a wife in that direction, Let's see. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Esau also saw how Isaac blessed Jacob and gave him a charge by saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. You are not to get a wife from the land of Canaan, from one of the daughters in the land of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father, his mother, and his mother, and was gone to Paddan Aram. And he also saw how Jacob didn't disobey, but he rather obeyed his father and his mother and went to uh, Paddan Aram. So what do you think is going on with Esau? There are two things in verse eight. And Esau seeing that the daughters of Canaan please not Isaac, his father. So Esau's observing this. He's seeing how the daughters of Canaan uh, did not make his father Isaac happy. Because Esau married one of the daughters of Canaan. Verse 9. Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had. Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael. So Esau, consequently, from seeing all that, goes to Ishmael and then tries to get him a wife. Takes himself a wife there. Uh, and what he has over there for uh, his wife is Mahalath, who is the daughter of Ishmael. And, uh, and Ishmael is obviously Abraham's son. The sister of Nabajoth 
to be his wife. Notice right here that Mahela is uh, Nabajoth's sister. And then he made sure to ma marry Mahela so that she can become his wife. Now, from verses six through eight, there are two possibilities again. Now I've given uh, uh, quite a few possibilities right here. So here's another one. Uh, I'll write it over, oh, what's a nice place? I'll put it here. All right, the next possibility to why Esau did this is as follows. One is because he's getting finally under conviction, okay? He realized that what he did really displeased his dad. Now, remember it said in the book of Hebrews that we looked last time, Esau tried to repent, right? So there's that conviction that's still uh, remaining in him. However, like I told you before, it's not genuine conviction, though, okay? So it's more of like uh, guilt, so to speak. It could be more of a guilt thing. The reason why Esau's repentance was uh, not genuine, as I mentioned to you before, is there's still some lack of recognition over his sin, his fault. I've explained that last time. So I'm not going to explain in this Genesis study. So because of that guilt that's running in him, which is why you got to be careful of that church, okay? So you got to watch out for this um, uh, repentance or seeking after a repentance that's not genuine repentance. Now, repentance is very simple. Like I told you before, it's a change of mind. It can be conviction over sin. But the problem is, is that when there is still a lack of recognition of your fault, then what's going to happen is there's going to be some kind of half level or a partial level of repentance and then you get this kind of guilt that Esau does. So then you try to make reparations for it without still recognizing you're wrong. Now, that's a horrible way of repentance, actually. You don't want to repent that way. So in Esau's marriage right here, you can see that we've already known his repentance is not genuine. So his guilt was eating him up. And that guilt was eating him up where he's trying to make reparations on something. That ain't going to do you any good. Judas Iscariot did the same thing as well, you might recall. Judas Iscariot, go to Matthew. Go to the book of Matthew. And then uh, 27. This time I think that chapter should be correct, all right? Let's see. That chapter is correct this time. We're going to go to Matthew 27 and then verse three through four, three through four. Two cases of bad repentance. One is Esau. The second is Judas Iscariot. Now, if there is a repentance you don't want to have is Judas Iscariot. He is the devil incarnate. Verse three, then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now, notice right here, there's a very important word at verse three, repented himself. Do you see that? So there is still a self-centeredness right here, a selfishness right here. So his repentance is not genuine. His repentance, like Esau, uh, I guess we'll go to one more verse. All right. Go to 2 Corinthians uh, 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So this is a very good verse for that because there is a sorrow of the world, see, a guilt trip of the world that is not a godly sort of repentance or a godly sorrow. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the what? Sorrow of the world worketh death. You don't want to be like that. Judas Iscariot, uh, we prematurely turn to the next verse. But if you go back to Matthew 27, Judas Iscariot tried to make reparations. He tried to get rid of that money that he received. But that ain't going to do any lick of good. The thing is this, is that it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, making amends, okay? 
then what's the problem right here? Again, it's that self-centeredness. You're doing that to make yourself feel good. See that? So Judas Iscariot did that because it's eating him up to hold that money. See, so he's not thinking about genuine repentance here. Like, what can I do to make things right? What's the right thing to do in the scriptures to repent? He's not thinking of that. He's just, this thing is eating me up. I just want to get rid of this blood money. And he thinks that's the way to repent. But that's just guilt eating you up. That's what Esau's doing. He's trying to marry somebody, uh, an, a, another person, because that guilt is eating him up. So that's not genuine repentance. You got to watch out for that. All right, go back to Genesis. Go back to Genesis. And then we'll look at chapter 28, chapter 28. Now, there is a second one here. There is a second. This is very interesting. Remember, Esau had a self-centered repentance, right? His repentance was not genuine. Now, this could be the consequence. The consequence is when Esau observed how it didn't please his father, it's not a matter of guilt. It could be following context. Remember, he's very bitter. So because he's bitter, he's trying to revenge, not repair. So then seeing how it displeased his family, he says, okay, then I'm going to uh, eat them up even more. So then that's why he marries within Ishmael's family. Now, let me explain right here, because it seems to be contradictory, okay? How Esau's trying to get to his family's good side by marrying Ishmael's side of the family is because Ishmael is from Abraham's line, right? However, if uh, the nation of Israel, they are not supposed to marry Ishmaelites. However, Esau can see this as some kind of halfway if it can please them halfway, right? So that could be possibility one. But possibility two is because that's still uh, not the right kind of marriage, he can see, well, th in this way, I can hurt my family. So then out of that bitterness, he marries uh, somebody else to give his family even more pain. Now, notice that the bottom line with this uh, lesson right here is a half-baked repentance will make you do either or. It gives you guilt and bitterness, if not both. So that's a very good sermon right here concerning about a half-baked repentance. So you got to watch out for that because uh, I'm not pure myself because I understand what it is. When I give a half-baked repentance to the Lord, what happens is these two emotions always rise up. Now, this can be a very good preaching right here, all right? But I speak from, uh, I speak for myself because I'm not a righteous person, all right? These two emotions and you know, I guarantee pretty much all of you have done that before. But you can guarantee that these two emotions do come out. It's guilt and bitterness. And that's not an easy feeling. So that's why you have to get rid of that self-centeredness. You have to realize I'm wrong. I surrender. I, I relinquish to you, Lord. When there's that repentance right there, that willingness to the father, then he can take care of that. But if there's a refusal, refusal there and you're like, I'll repent this part, but not this part. You see that? What happens? There's that half-baked repentance right there. Okay, let's go to Genesis uh, 28. Genesis 28. Now we're going to explain the contradiction in the scripture. So I found, uh, so there's a contradiction in your King James Bible. Look at right here, verse 9. Esau, he uh, takes uh, the wives, which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael. All right, so Mahalath is Ishmael's daughter, right, that Esau married? Okay, there seems to be a contradiction. Go to Genesis 36. Genesis 36. You know, when you hear these atheists, you know, giving contradictions in the Bible, I just laugh. I help them out. Yeah, what about this verse? What about that verse? <laughs> You know, we already know about this, all right? We already know about this. We don't become Christians because, like, uh, when we read the Bible, that uh, when we see some verses that, oh, uh, 
I'll never see a contradiction. No, there are places you can find contradictions. But in reality, there are no contradictions in the Bible, which makes us believe it even more so. What makes us believe that book more so is not just because of no challenges, because there are challenges. When we see these challenges answered, then what makes that confirms our faith even more. But if we take things nonchalantly with our faith and just go things blindly without some kind of critical thinking, then how can we know what we believe in to be true? So these challenges are actually really good. So no, I'm, I'm not scared of challenges. Go ahead, challenge me, all right? And yeah, I'll admit there are some that I don't have answers to. Oh, so then what? I'm gonna throw away my faith because of that? No, if I don't have answers to, I'm gonna study, okay? Why? Because I don't have all the answers. When a person studies more, they find more answers. And when those answers support that book even more so, what happens to your faith? It increases tenfold. But what people do with challenges nowadays is that they refuse to study. They don't study. They just go by the system or what they are told or what they've learned. and They just believe everything. That's a foolish thing. You know, I went to higher ed classes myself. That's a very foolish thing to do. You know, they, they brag and boast about critical thinking, higher ed and et cetera. Well, that's fine and dandy, but you're not really using critical thinking. I know what they mean. Critical thinking according to their terms, how they set it up. Because if you're genuinely honest, when you read the material, you don't have time to look at other databases, other teachers, other teachers, other resources out there to critique what you're learning. No, you don't have time for that. you got to memorize what they're telling you and make sure you go by their teachings, their answers, so that you can get a good grade. You don't have time to critique everything. So don't tell me. I tell you, all right? I've been through that. It's, all right? it's, it's a weird thing nowadays. It's a weird thing. So, when he, uh, so Christians, we enjoy the challenges because... The reason why is it gives us time, it gives us that moment to study more. And the Bible commands to study. It says to study a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. That's what the Bible says. We believe in that. But nowadays, when you challenge public opinion nowadays, they censor it, right? They'll limit it, right? Or they'll scream at you. Or they don't talk reasonably. Welcome to our world. World of hypocrisy and lies. They tell you one thing, but they do another. We go to uh, Genesis chapter 36. So then here's that uh, supposed contradiction. Verse two, Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite. And look at this. Not, it doesn't match Genesis 28. And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabajah. No, it should be Mahaleth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebuchadnezzar. So there seems to be a contradiction. Oh, I can even prove more so of the scribal error, that it's a scribal error, that they were half asleep. They weren't paying attention. Uh, uh, go to Genesis 26, 26, the verse we read. Genesis 26. And then uh, we'll look at the last verse, okay? The last verse which is 34 the last two verses <laughs> 34 and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beri the Hittite and who Bashamath now remember Genesis 36 says Bashamath the daughter of Ishmael but this is Bashamath the daughter of Elon the Hittite oh so this is the evidence of scribal error what happened was the scribe was half asleep he's gonna get his names right so he switched uh, Ishmael's daughter's name with the other wife of Esau, Bashamath, which is belonging to a Hittite, not an Ishmaelite, just mixed information together. See, there's an error in your King James Bible. I told you so. All right. Uh -huh. All right. So the answer, uh, there are two possible explanations for this. Okay. Uh, one, it's, uh, one, it is common that, uh, that there are people that can have common names. So that's not a big surprise. It doesn't prove evidence of scribal error. No, you need actual evidence of that. How do you not know that this is because that name is very common? Like, for example, Judas is a very common name. If you look at the four Gospels, 
there are Judases, several Judases, and then Johns. So then you, it's kind of mixing up information. Even in this church, you're going to, in this kind of a size of our church, all right, we're not mega church, but we already have like three people who can share similar names, believe it or not. So that's just very common, okay? Uh, if you have common names like that, then how do we explain this contradiction about Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nabajoth to be his wife? Well, Mah Mahalath, it is very possible that she can have an alternative name, which is Bashamah. Now, that is also very common. If you look at Acts chapter 1, for example, you're going to notice, ah, you know what, let's just do that. Okay, go to Acts 1. All right, I'm not just going to give an explanation. Let's go to Acts 1. Notice that a person can have multiple names. And also within this multiple name, it could be a very common name as well, a common name. <coughs> Let's look at Acts chapter one, verse 23. And they appointed to Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So notice right here that uh, Joseph was called Barsabas and with the surname Justice. Joseph is a very common name, you have to realize. There were several Josephs in that timeline. There was a Joseph who buried, who found the, uh, who tried to bury the body of Jesus in his own family too. So that's a common name. Plus he has two alternatives names. How do you not know that Mahalath was the same thing? She had a common name and then also alternative names. But another thing is this. Another thing is when we look back right here, notice the difference. This ain't really a scribal error right here because when you look at chapter 36 again, you're not paying attention. Talking about a scribe falling asleep. I think the critic was falling asleep. He wasn't paying attention to the verses he was critiquing. All right, go to Genesis 36, verse two. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. Now go back to Genesis 26. How is that any, anywhere close? Go to Genesis 26, verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Berai, the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. How is that anywhere close? Even if he's falling asleep, he wouldn't make up these, uh, you, if you were falling asleep, you wouldn't have the capacity to make up new names like that. Talk about critics falling asleep, man. Or more honestly, critics trying to find an error because they want to find an error. That's the more honest truth. What do you think is the more reasonable route? Okay, so notice that there's nowhere even close, okay? This is uh, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, but we see right here two, uh, right here, two daughters of Hittites. But he mentions one daughter from the Hittite and then another daughter from a Hivite. Then he covers Ishmael. So notice that these names differ from Genesis 26 as well as 28, or there are similarities. You know what the simple answer is? He had multiple wives. Esau had multiple wives. Who are you to say he only had three? It was common. I mean, his younger brother, Jacob, had four, all right? And Esau, it was common. It's common. I studied even cultural anthropology from a liberal professor. God help me, right? But even they talked about polygamy, how why that was common is because to increase the seed, Okay. So because of increasing children, you can have multiple wives. So it's only covering a portion. By the way, you didn't read that passage at Genesis 27 that we read. If you look at Genesis 28, excuse me, Genesis 28, notice the wording right here. In verse 9, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto him a wife. Is that what it says? took unto the wives which he had, Mahalat, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. So notice right here that he was taking, who's to say that he took himself 
one wife. How do you not know? He took in multiple wives right here. And then one of them was Mahalath. And then the other one could be Bashamath. But even if that interpretation doesn't stand, who, uh, who's to say that he only had three wives? Later on, he could have married more. It's just, it's just that simple. So he had multiple wives. It was very common that time. So you can't find a contradiction if there are ex alternative explanations that are common throughout the day. You didn't prove a contradiction then. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. The criticism is at fault or the so-called contradiction from the skeptic or the critic is at fault if their, if their statement is something that is not common throughout the day. If it contradicts the timeline of that day, what was common or popular that time, then uh, that contradiction shouldn't stand. It should be critiqued actually. So we critique the critic. All right, anyway, verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Ugh, this was going to be the fun doctrine. I have to end it here. Okay, so I, I cannot uh, give you that deep doctrine. All right. Remember that gateway to heaven that the Tower of Babel was trying to build? All right, I was about to teach that, but I cannot do that. So I have to end it off right here. So we end it off right here. I will continue on with Jacob's ladder. And there's the, something very interesting right here. Who is that ladder? And there is uh, another reason I'm going to give to you why God really stopped the Tower of Babel. There's a reason why. I think it's because his deity is at stake. That's why, the credit of his, his deity. But... I'll explain you that next Genesis study, okay? Let's close with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for salvation through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth of your word and the knowledge of the scripture. Uh, bless the fellowship, the next service we're about to partake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.